Hi everyone. So today we'll be discussing inheritance and really two types of inheritance, Mendelian and non-Mendelian inheritance. So this picture from your book on the first slide is a picture of a typical Mendelian inheritance uh, problem or question. And so there are some characteristics of a specific Mendelian inheritance question. When you think about traits that are inherited from your parents, like eye color, hair color, etc., those traits are passed on in a very specific manner. And many years ago, it was thought that Mendelian inheritance is how all traits were passed down. So any trait ranging from um, personality traits, um, uh, predispositions to diseases like cancer, and the typical physical traits like hair color and eye color were all passed down in a Mendelian inheritance pattern. But this inheritance pattern fails to take into account the complexity of passing on genes uh, in families. And so most of the characteristics that you see passed on in a Mendelian fashion are single gene disorders. So for example, cystic fibrosis and sickle cell anemia are caused by one single gene being mutated. So in such a way, you can uh, apply typical Mendelian inheritance rules and see what percentage of offspring might have the disease, how many might be carriers, and what percent uh, would not have the disease. And so those are typical traits that you can apply Mendelian inheritance uh, rules for. Typically, when students learn Mendelian inheritance, it's by means of a Punnett square, which I'll teach you. And typically, hair color and eye color are used. Uh, we now know hair color and eye color are actually much more complex. They are coded for by at least three to five different genes. So they do not typically follow a Mendelian inheritance pattern. Nevertheless, we will still use them as examples of Mendelian inheritance because they're easy to follow and easier to understand. Uh, Non-Mendelian inheritance, on the other hand, is how most traits, uh, uh, most disease predispositions are passed down. So uh, non-Mendelian inheritance I'll talk about um, partway through this lecture. But for example, epigenetics, which we've already talked about, is a type of non-Mendelian inheritance pattern. So first of all, let's start with our discussion on Mendelian inheritance. So Punnett squares are crosses that involve two parents um, and really four possible offspring combinations of uh, what their DNA looks like. And in these types of crosses, we're interested in a particular trait. Um, so like hair color or eye color. And really what we do is we cross the parental generations, which are abbreviated as the P generation, and we get four possible offspring from that cross, and those are called the F1 generation. If we take two of those offspring and cross them together, then that gives us yet the next generation, which we would call the F2 generation. And so what we're interested in looking at are ratios in the F1s and the F2s. Typically, we want to focus on looking for a genotype ratio and a phenotype ratio. Genotype ratio, meaning what are the different combinations of genes, and then phenotype ratio, what are the actual physical traits. So usually um, color is used, like hair color or eye color. Now, to be classified as dominant versus recessive, dominant means this is the characteristic that is found at a higher proportion in the population, meaning it is dominant. We use letters to represent different genes, and so we can use the letter A, for example, to represent a gene for eye color or hair color. And so the capital A would be the dominant allele, and allele is the version of the gene that you get. So you get two alleles for every gene, so you would have gotten one allele from your mom and one allele from your dad. The recessive allele is the lowercase letter, so the little a, for example, and that would indicate the recessive phenotype or color. So generally with hair color, for example, hair color brown is usually dominant, so it would be capital A in this example, 
And then hair color blonde is recessive and it would be lowercase a in that example. And so people can be either homozygous or heterozygous or the versions of genes that they get from their parents. If you think about the way you can combine the little a and the big A such that you have two, um, there are three different ways. Two capital A's, two little a's, or one capital and one little. And so the ones that are the same, meaning the two capital A's and the two lowercase a's, those are termed homozygous because you have the same version of the gene from each parent. And so you would indicate the difference between them as homozygous dominant for the capital A's, homozygous recessive for the lowercase a's. And those two would code for uh, brown hair color and blonde hair color respectively. Now, if you had a heterozygous individual, also known as a hybrid or a carrier, um, these would be the uppercase A with the lowercase a. So because there are two different versions of that gene, we call that individual heterozygous. If it was a disease, you would call that individual a carrier because what happens with that circumstance is the lowercase a, so that phenotype, is masked by the dominant allele. So that individual would actually have the brown hair color, for example, and the blonde, the little a, is actually masked by the presence of that dominant um, a. So that's why in disease terms that individual is called a carrier because they carry a version of a gene that could lead to a disease, the little a for example, but they themselves do not have the disease. It is masked by the presence of a uh, dominant a in that circumstance. So these all apply to monohybrid crosses. And monohybrid crosses is where you're looking at one particular trait being passed on in a family. But you can certainly look at more than one trait. Um, you can look at two different things that segregate together, and those would be known as dihybrid crosses. Likewise, you could look at three different things that are segregating together, and those would be trihybrid crosses, and so on. So some genes are actually linked together very closely on the chromosome. And so you can follow them through in this manner. Um, Sex-linked inheritance is actually non-Mendelian inheritance, but I will. it is discussed in the Mendelian portion of your book. And so I'll give you an example of a sex-linked cross. And what that means is that we have some genes that are uh, found on our X chromosomes and some genes that are likewise found on Y chromosomes. So you can imagine if you have a female with two Xs, versus a male with only one X, but one Y, um, the probabilities of whether you get certain genes from your parents in that circumstance really depends on if you're male or female. And so we can uh, take a look at those sex-linked inheritance problems as well. But for now, on the right-hand side of this image, you see an example of a typical monohybrid cross. You have purple flowers here on the left and white flowers here on the right. This is your parental generation, and it tells you that this is a cross between true breeding pea plants. And what true breeding means, it's another way of saying homozygous, but in plant terminology. So these are homozygous uh, purple flowers, these are homozygous white flowers. When you cross two of them together, all of your offspring happen to be purple. And that tells you that the purple color is dominant in the population. The recessive color must be the white flowers. And because we know they're homozygous, that must mean this purple plant would be two capital P's, for example, and this white plant would be two little P's, for example. These hybrids must be all heterozygous, and I'll show you how you get that from a Punnett square cross. When you self-fertilize or when you cross two members of the F1 generation, you get this type of F2 typical ratio, and it's a 3 to 1 dominant to recessive ratio that you would get. And again, I'll go through how you can do these crosses. <clears throat> Firstly, here from your book are some examples of dominant and recessive traits. So on the left-hand side, we have dominant traits, and on the right-hand side, we have recessive traits. And this is just to... <clears throat> to illustrate to you that some diseases are passed down 
on the recessive allele, for example, the little a. Um, and some diseases are actually passed on in the dominant allele, so the capital A, meaning if you have at least one capital A, you have the disease. So those are usually appearing in every generation in a family, and much of the time, 50% of the family is affected. You can imagine that if you have a disease linked to the capital A, you would see that disease manifest in the homozygous dominant individuals and in the heterozygous individuals. Whereas if you had a recessive disease manifest, it would only manifest in the homozygous recessive individuals. Whereas the heterozygotes would just be carriers, they wouldn't actually have the disease. Huntington's disease is a very typical example of a dominant uh, type of disorder. So it's passed on through the dominant allele, like the capital A, and hence a lot of genetic testing is done in families that carry Huntington's disease, because there is a good chance that if your parents have it, then you would have it as well. Typical recessive traits are uh, cystic fibrosis, which I mentioned before, and sickle cell anemia, where um, cystic fibrosis is a respiratory disorder and sickle cell anemia uh, basically affects the whole body because the blood cells are misshapen. So Mendel, through doing various crosses and studying um, plants, he coined three laws of inheritance so that alleles can be dominant or recessive, which I've already mentioned. They all segregate um, equally, so you get the same chance of having one from your mom, one from your dad, and they all assort independently, with the exception of genes that are linked together. So every gene has its own probability of being passed on to the offspring. So here's an example of that monohybrid cross. So here we have garden peas, <clears throat> capital Y for yellow color, so yellow is dominant. This individual has two capital Ys, so is yellow. And then lowercase y for the recessive color, um, which is green. So this individual is homozygous recessive. Now, in terms of the cross, so what you would do is you would look at what potential alleles could this parent give to its offspring. And the only allele this parent can give is a capital Y. So it can either give a capital Y or it can give a capital Y. So capital Y, this individual gives to its offspring. On the other hand, this individual can only give a lowercase y, so the green allele. So this individual will always give, sorry, that green allele, and hence your F1 generation will be 100% um, heterozygous. <clears throat> and that's the genotype information. In the F1, we have 100% heterozygous individuals. In the phenotype circumstance, we would say that in the F1 generation, they are 100% yellow. So phenotype meaning color, um, genotype meaning the underlying alleles, the Ys in this case. Now what happens when we cross two of the F1 generation together? So two of these individuals. So take a look at what this individual here, the F1 individual can give to its child. It can give a capital Y, and it can give a little y. And so imagine we have two of those individuals and we're mating them together. So one option is a capital Y, and I would put that, I would first draw a square like this with four um, possible offspring and write the possible alleles that the first parent can give at the top. So this parent could give a capital Y or a little y here. Now, if we had a second parent that was heterozygous, it's the same thing. They would give a capital Y or a little y. And then we show a typical Punnett square like this where we cross the individuals together. So in each square, we would write out the F2 generation, which would be a result of the potential cross between one parent and the other parent. So in this box, we have a capital Y and a capital Y. So we have a homozygous dominant individual. In this box, we have a capital Y and a lowercase y. So we have a heterozygous individual. Down here, we have a capital Y and a little y. So again, a heterozygous individual. And here we have a lowercase y and another lowercase y. And so we have a homozygous recessive individual. 
So in terms of the genotype ratios, which you see written down here, there's one individual that's homozygous dominant, one that's homozygous recessive, and two that are heterozygous. So your genotype ratio is actually one to two to one. Your phenotype ratio is different in this circumstance. Here you have, you have to look at the color. So what's the color of these garden peas? Three of them are yellow. Remember the heterozygotes, the little y green color is masked by the effects of the capital Y yellow color. So they would show the dominant phenotype. So three are yellow, one is green. So your phenotype ratio for the F2 generation is three to one. Now, what you can also do is uh, to figure out the parent, a dominant parent. So if you're going backwards, you can actually use um, data from the F1 generation to figure out what the parents look like. So sometimes you might be asked a question about that. And so that's called a test cross. So imagine you have a yellow garden pea, but you, don't, you know the first letter must be capital Y but you don't know what the second letter is. All you know is it's the dominant yellow color. Well, what you can do to find out that second letter is cross that individual with a homozygous recessive individual. And that will help you find out what that second letter was. If you do this type of cross, it depends on what the offspring look like as to what that second letter was. So imagine you did this cross, here are the recessive letters from this parent. Here's the capital Y from the first yellow parent. And here's a question mark. And in this case, let's say this was a capital Y. If this was a capital Y, you would then do your Punnett square and you would see 100% of your offspring were yellow. Now, if you did the same thing down here, and instead you pretend this is a lowercase y, you would see a one to one ratio, yellow to green. So you would see that recessive green color come up in the F1 generation. So if a question was posed to you where 100% of the offspring were yellow, that tells you that the second allele for the dominant parent must be the capital Y. But instead, if the question tells you that 50% of the offspring are green and 50% are yellow, then that tells you that dominant parent must have been a heterozygous parent, such that that green color shows up in the next generation. So let's take an example of sickle cell anemia. And here I've indicated to you three different crosses for sickle cell disease. So, Let's take, for example, in a question, capital S indicates a healthy individual, and the lowercase s indicates sickle cell disease. That tells you that sickle cell disease is a recessive disease. So let's now say that mom, mom is a carrier for sickle cell disease, and dad has sickle cell disease. So the appropriate um, genotype, or sorry, the appropriate genotype for mom is that she's heterozygous because she's a carrier. And here's a cross to indicate that she's mating with the father. And the father has sickle cell disease, so he must be homozygous recessive. So mom can give a capital S or she can give a little s. Dad can give a little s or a little s again. And so when you do this Punnett square and do the cross, you can see that there's a one-to-one -one ratio of healthy individuals to those who have sickle cell disease. So your genotype ratio is one to one, or sorry, I guess I should say that's your phenotype ratio uh, of those who have the disease versus they don't have the disease. So one to one. Your genotype ratio is the same, however, because 50% are heterozygous and 50% are homozygous recessive. So that's also a one to one ratio. You can write your results in a ratio, or you can write your results as a percentage. Now let's take another example. <clears throat> let's say mom is homozygous dominant, and let's say dad has, again, sickle cell disease. So if mom is homozygous dominant, she has two capital S's, and if dad has sickle cell disease, he has two lowercase s's. So mom can give a capital S or a capital S. Dad can give a little s or another little s. If you do the cross, you see that they're all heterozygous, just as the first example I showed you on the first slide 
uh, with the violet or purple plants and white plants. And so in terms of the genotype, 100% are heterozygous. And in terms of the phenotype, 100% are healthy, uh, but they're also thought of as carriers, right? Uh, they don't have the disease, but they do carry a little s with the, each of them. So they are carriers, but in terms of having the disease, they don't have it, but they can pass it on. Now let's take a third example where mom is a carrier and dad is a carrier. So that means mom and dad are both heterozygous. Mom can give a little s, or sorry, mom can give a big s and mom can give a little s. Same thing with dad, big s or little s. When we do this cross, we get in the first box two capital S's, so homozygous dominant. In the next box, <coughs> we get a heterozygous individual. Then down here, we have a heterozygous individual and then a homozygous recessive individual. And this tells us we have the same types of ratio that I showed you in a couple of slides ago, where the genotype ratio is one homozygous uh, dominant, two carriers or heterozygotes, and one homozygous recessive individual. So it's a one to two to one crop, uh, ratio. For phenotype, it's different. It's how many are healthy versus how many have the disease. So if you look at the individuals who each have a capital S, there are three of them. So it's a three to one that has two lowercase s's, which has the disease. So it's a three to one ratio for this particular cross. So you can follow through um, a family by looking at a family pedigree. And so the first generation is normally at the top of a family pedigree. And the fourth generation or the last generation is usually at the bottom. And so usually you'll have a legend for a pedigree. Um, and this legend tells you that the squares are males, the circles are females, yellow is unaffected, and blue is affected. And it doesn't matter what the disease is. Um, it's just for any disease, you can use this type of pedigree. So we have a blue square here that tells you that this male is affected by the disease. We have a yellow circle here that tells you that this female, um, that the, where they made it together, this female is not affected by a disease. They happen to have a child, and this child um, is little a, little a, and this child is affected. So what that tells you is this little a, little a genotype must be uh, for the disease. And so you have to have a little a to have the disease. So this one is not a dominant disease, it's a recessive disease. So that must mean that dad has little a, little a as well. Now mom, on the other hand, um, so far we can guess that mom is heterozygous uh, because if mom were homozygous dominant, the child would have inherited one capital A. Um, so there would have been no other choice. And you can follow through that pedigree or that Punnett square on the side. You can try a Punnett square where dad or one of the parents is homozygous recessive, the other parent is homozygous dominant, and you would see that all of the offspring would then be heterozygous. But that's not the case here. The case here is that this child is homozygous recessive, meaning that mom would have had to be a heterozygote in order to get a child that's homozygous recessive. And then that individual mates with a healthy person who again is heterozygous. And then you have a line going down to indicate three children by this couple. And so you have one female who is affected by the disease, one male where um, they have one capital A, so they are healthy, and then another female who is healthy and heterozygous. And so this female happens to mate with a male, and they have two children, one that's affected, one unaffected. And then this affected female happens to mate with a male. We don't know his genotype, uh, but they happen to have an affected female. So we don't know his genotype, but by doing the same kind of cross as we did early on, we would know then that this individual has to be heterozygous. 
So you need to use some logic and you need to do some Punnett squares in order to figure out genotypes within this family. And that's actually what the career of a genetic counselor is. A genetic counselor goes to school for first genetics, so a biology degree, and then goes into a master's program called genetic counseling where they learn uh, counseling techniques as well. And so they sit down with families that have diseases running in the family and they draw out pedigrees for those families and show them how or what percent chance they would have in terms of their children of developing a certain disease, diseases that are passed on in such a manner. So <clears throat> this is how Mendelian inheritance works. But as I mentioned to you, there's another part of inheritance that's called non-Mendelian inheritance, also known as alternatives to dominance and recessiveness. These are also just called variations. Um, and so this is really how most traits and most diseases are passed on. So early on in teaching biology, you may have learned all of these Punnett square rules if you've taken biology before, and that's generally how it's taught at the high school level um, and even at the college level in some circumstances. But now in more and more research points to the fact that most diseases don't follow typical Mendelian inheritance rules. Um, only very specific traits do, and uh, again, very few diseases. Most of the time, it's a combination of different genes that gives rise to a particular trait, um, even hair color or eye color. And so these are some examples of alternatives to dominance and recessiveness. There's something called incomplete dominance, another thing called codominance, multiple alleles, and multiple alleles is where we have different genes coding for the same trait. X-linked or sex-linked traits, Epigenetics, which I've already told you about, pleiotropy, um, which is essentially the opposite of multiple alleles, the idea that one single gene can give rise to multiple traits in the body. And the last one is aneuploidy, and this is like uh, having an extra chromosome or one less chromosome. So Down syndrome would be an example of aneuploidy. So these are examples of both codominance and incomplete dominance. So I want to bring you back to the example of a heterozygous, uh, of a typical heterozygous cross, where we have two members of the F1 generation crossed together. We get a typical three to one ratio in the uh, in the offspring. Um, and so when we have this typical ratio, three are dominant colored and one is recessive co uh, color. So yellow to green, three to one in this circumstance. Imagine if we had uh, red and white flowers, it would be three red flowers to one white flower. Well, what in incomplete dominance tells you is that one of those dominant alleles is not completely dominant over the other. So like the capital Y is not completely dominant over the lowercase y, meaning that you're going to get a mixed color in the heterozygotes. So your ratio for the genotypes would not change. But in this example, and if we apply flower color, if we had three red flowers and one white flower here um, as our three to one ratio. Well, actually in incomplete dominance, the two heterozygotes would be a mix of the red and white. So they'd be like, um, pink colored flowers, for example. So you'd actually have a one to two to one ratio for the phenotypes. You'd have one that's red, two that are showing the incomplete color, which is pink, and one that's showing the white color. So incomplete dominance tells you that the two phenotypes, uh, where the dominant one is red, for example, is not completely dominant over the white. Codominance tells you a very similar version. So imagine you have those two heterozygotes in the, in the cross, and those two heterozygotes would show, instead of a pink color, they would show codominance of the two colors. So imagine you had red and white again. That heterozygote must show both colors. So it would be like white flowers with red spots, where both the red and the white are shown relatively equally. 
So that's what codominance is, is where you have heterozygotes, but they show both of those phenotypes or colors in the heterozygous individuals. Uh, multiple alleles, this isn't really too necessary to memorize. It's just a picture from your book showing um, a specific type of rodent um, where you see a variety. If you look at this last panel here, you see a variety of different shades of fur color um, and they can be dispersed differently all throughout the body. And this is due to multiple different alleles. So you can see that this is quite different than just having a capital C and a lowercase c. There's different things going on, and you might have two of them or just one of them. There's different things going on to give rise to these different phenotypes. And so that's the idea behind multiple alleles. There are multiple alleles and multiple genes that could be coding for the same trait. Um, so that's really how most traits are inherited. <coughs> Now this is sex-linked inheritance, and this is an alternative to Mendelian inheritance, but you still see the typical Punnett square that you can look at with, um, which you look at with Mendelian inheritance patterns. Now, fruit flies um, is a good example of a sex-like trait because they have a sex-like trait, it's eye color. And so fruit fly eye color is either going to be red or it's going to be white. And what we now know is that this eye color is inherited on the X chromosome. So it's sex linked. And so whenever you see in a question that something is X linked or sex linked, that tells you you have to apply chromosomes to it. And so a male, the two chromosomes for a male are X and Y. Two chromosomes for a female over here are two capital X's. Now, we still need to apply a letter to the trait. So for example, we're going to use W, where little w is the recessive trait, which you would have to be told is the white color. And then <clears throat> capital W is the red colored uh, trait for the eye color. So it's dominant. So let's take the possible combinations that mom can give to her children. She could give an X chromosome with a little W, so the white eye color, or she could give an X chromosome with a little W. What dad can give is the his X chromosome with the capital W, so the red gene, or he can give a Y. The Y doesn't have any let letter relating to the trait because it's not inherited on the Y chromosome. So if he has males, male children, then he would not be passing on an allele on that Y chromosome. Write out the chromosomes first and then apply the letters to it as well. So here, if we have mom's X, we would write X. And we have dad's X, we would write X. Mom can give a little W, which is up here, and dad can give a capital W. So this is a female, two X's, but importantly, this is a female who has capital W and little w, so heterozygous, right? So she will have the dominant color, which is red eyes, but she will carry a gene for the recessive color, which is the white eye color. Let's look at this female. She inherits two X's, one from mom, one from dad. She also inherits a capital W from dad and a little w from mom. And so she also has the red eyes. Now looking down here, we have an X from mom with a little w and a Y from dad. So this male has white eyes, he has the little w, he doesn't have any other allele on the Y. And so it's important to note that whatever the male gets from mom on the X chromosome is what he will display, is the trait that he'll display. So there is no information from dad that's passed on for this trait uh, because it's not passed on on the Y chromosome. So he actually gets no input from dad as to what his eye color will be. Same thing for this male. So we have an X with a little W from mom and then we have a Y from dad. So it's a male, um, but it, uh, this male has white eyes as well. So if you look at the results of this cross, you would say that 50% of the offspring have red eyes and 50% of the offspring have white eyes. Alternatively, you can say 
and start categorizing this as males versus females. So you could say that 100% of the daughters or females have red eyes. And you can then also say 100% of the males or the sons have white eyes. So uh, there are different ways in which you could write the results of this type of cross, and that's something you want to keep in mind. X-linked diseases are passed on in humans as well, um, and X-linked traits are. So it's the same kind of information. And this picture is a little bit busy, but it's also showing the same thing as in the previous picture. Um, so if you have an unaffected father and a carrier mother, <clears throat> remember it's the mother that will determine what her sons receive. Um, so she will be able to either pass on the recessive allele um, to her, her sons, uh, sorry, I keep mentioning this one, but to her son over here or over here. She, he, these sons, the one here and here, they get whatever mom has. Um, and they only get the Y chromosome from the dad, which again, he doesn't have anything to contribute in terms of this particular um, allele or gene. And so this dad only contributes to his um, daughters. Now let's take an example of a sex-linked inheritance problem with color vision. So let's say that capital R indicates normal color vision, so it's dominant. And let's say lowercase r indicates red-green color blindness. Don't forget that females have two X chromosomes, males have an X and a Y. So let's take the first scenario. Mom has normal color vision and she's not a carrier, so she must have two capital R's. So mom has two X chromosomes, don't forget to write those in first, and then you give each of them a capital R because she's homozygous dominant for that. Dad has red-green color blindness, so he has the lowercase r here. So we write out dad's X chromosome with the Y chromosome, and then we have to remember to add his trait. Um, so the, the letter that we're using for the trait is R, and he has red-green color blindness, so he has a lowercase r. He only gets one allele. Don't forget that because he only has one X chromosome. So mom is able to pass on an X with an R or an X with an R, capital R, in both circumstances. <clears throat> and dad can pass on an X with a lowercase r or a Y to his offspring. So let's say um, we do this cross. Let's figure out what the children look like. So this female is heterozygous. She has normal color vision. The next female, she again is heterozygous. She has normal color vision. This son, so he gets the X with the capital R from mom and a Y from dad, and same with this son. And they both have capital R's, so that means they have normal color vision. So 100% of the offspring have normal color vision. And if we want to just look at the daughters, it's the same thing. It's 100% of the daughters. Um, and again, if we just want to look at the males, let's pretend females don't exist, 100% of the males have normal color vision. Let's take a second example where mom has normal vision, but she is a carrier and dad has normal vision. So mom has normal vision. She has to have one capital R on one of her X chromosomes, but she is a carrier. So she has a little r too on the next chromosome. Uh, here's dad's chromosomes, X and Y. On his X, he gets the capital R because he has normal color vision. <clears throat> so mom can pass on the capital R with the X or the little r with the X. Dad can pass on the capital R with the X or his Y chromosome. Now doing this cross, you would see that the first female daughter, she's homozygous dominant. The next daughter is heterozygous. In either case, both these daughters have normal color vision. Now, the next individual, the son, has the capital R from mom, so he's protected. He has normal color vision. But the last child, the second son, he has the little R from mom and the Y from dad. So he actually has red-green color blindness, even though both parents have normal color vision. But because mom carries it on one of her X chromosomes, it's passed on to one of her sons. And that's typically what you see in a pedigree. You suddenly see the appearance of a sex linked disease in just the males. And it's through the carrier mothers how, these how the males actually get this uh, trait for the disease. 
So we can say that 75% of, of the offspring have the normal color vision, so these three, and 25% of the offspring are red-green color blindness. Now, if you just look at the daughters, 100% have normal vision, and if you just look at the sons, 50% have normal vision. So please understand that the percentages will be different depending on if you're looking at the offspring as a whole versus just the uh, daughters versus just the sons. So the last thing I wanted meant to mention was aneuploidy. And something we've already talked about were monosomies, which is where we have one less uh, chromosome. So like Klinefelter syndrome or Turner syndrome that we discussed in our cell division unit, those are examples where a female has one less chromosome of her sex chromosome and a male has an extra, uh, a one less or extra. Um, trisomy is where we have Down syndrome and Down syndrome is when we have an extra copy of chromosome number 21. Now this picture from your book is just showing that as maternal age increases over the age of 40, you see a risk of Down syndrome in live births as a percentage. Um, severely increasing. And again, that can be due to um, damage that's happening over time in DNA replication in the cell. So those are examples of alternatives to dominance and recessiveness as well. The fact that you can inherit extra chromosomes or one less chromosome. So that's all I wanted to mention with Mendelian and non-Mendelian inheritance. If you have any questions, please feel free to let me know.